Sabbath to each and every one of you. We are in full summer mode right now. That's right. And our generational ministries have some fun things that are happening. That's right. Starting July 11, there's Family Fun Night. It goes from 6 to 8 p.m. It's at the Loma Linda Academy Elementary School. It's always great fun. We really encourage you to come out. It's only three Wednesdays. It starts July 11. Our high school ministry, which is led by Pastor Jonathan, has some fun things planned for this month of July. And here's Pastor Jonathan to tell you more details. Hello, church family. We are excited for what's to come. So what we call is our youth summer camp. And every week we have an event or an activity that we do, whether it's going out to the beach, whether it's Six Flags, we have every week something planned out that we want to continue to grow because our purpose at our Regent High School Ministry is home, family, and faith. So if you want more information about this summer, please feel free to look in your bulletins and you will find my email or my phone number. And we want to make sure. So July 6th, that's right, July 6th is our first event and we're going to be heading on that Friday. Thank you so much for your help and God bless you today. Rooted, our Young Professional SAP School is starting a brand new series entitled Summer School. This is where you'll have the opportunity to hear from different members of our community, including a lawyer, a doctor, a professional coach, and a religion professor on what they're learning about following Jesus. We really encourage you to check that out. It's in Griggs Hall, room 138. Our church is partnering with Quiet Hour Ministries for an upcoming mission trip. Here is Pastor Roy to give you more details. Hi, church family. I want to invite you to join me on a mission trip to Duitama, Colombia this September 19 through 30. Now, this is a magical place that just three years ago, an incredible story took place because people like you went to Duitama to do mission work, and I want you to find out more about it. So click on our church's website's link to the mission trip to Duitama, Colombia to get more information. There's opportunities for everyone if you'd like to do healthcare or construction or help with children's ministry or even be one of the presenters who gives the evangelistic sermons at multiple sites where we are. I'd love to have you join me, so please check out the link at the website for more information. And I hope that you'll join me so together we can see God at work. We've been talking about it for several weeks now, a Bible Land tour. It's filling up fast for more information. It's happening in March with Pastor Randy, Dr. Garrity, and Dr. Rumlet. You want to go to our website and click on, on the banner there and you can find out more information. It is filling up fast. We encourage you to check it out. Our pastoral staff and nominating committee had been hard at work. The results of all that work are in the church bulletin this week. There you should have a copy of the nominating committee report for 2018 through 2021. Please take a look at that and we'll have more opportunities to discuss this in the future weeks ahead. And then just a quick reminder, next week is a very special communion Sabbath. That's next Sabbath, we encourage you to come out. Well, that's our announcements for today. For more information, of course, check the bulletin, the website, the app, or we are always welcome at the Uconnect Center in the foyer. We love you all. Have a great Sabbath.
Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. One more good time. Happy Sabbath, brothers and sisters. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. It is a privilege to welcome you to this beautiful church service today here at the Loma Linda University Church. We welcome you as our members, as well as those of you of our friends and family who may be watching either online or on your TV sets today. We'd like to give you a chance to greet each other this morning. So turn to your neighbor beside you and say, it is truly good to see you today. other. Love seeing you here. Pastor Adrian, thank you so much. It's my privilege to be here on the platform this morning with the Leukert family. This is Christian Leukert. I'm going to have him introduce his family in just one moment. But you recognize the Leukerts, no doubt, with, from their work with our children's choirs. Junior choir on Christian's part, cherub choir on Amy's part, and the wonderful experience that we have in worship whenever they sing. Well, it's my privilege to announce to you that Christian is the most recent member of our pastoral team. He is coming on in a role for music and worship. Amen. Now, let me explain just a moment what that's about. The reality is that we have a wonderful music staff already in place, but they all have employment elsewhere besides Loma Linda University Church, and we have long needed a full-time person who sits with us on the staff to administer and guide the team, to help us in our worship planning, and many other duties and details. In fact, over the last mm, almost year now, Pastor Marvin Ponder has been working with us in that capacity on an interim basis. Well, starting tomorrow morning, <laughs> starting July 1, Christian joins us full time, and we're just delighted to have him. He's coming from Loma Linda Academy, from working there in the music department. So let me start, Christian, having you introduce Amy and the girls. Sure. This is my amazing wife, Amy, and uh, she works at La Sierra University, uh, the Center for Research in Adventist Education, run through the uh, School, of, School of Ed there, and she's the associate director. And then these are my two sweet girls. This is Liana, and this is Kaylee a giant fourth grader and second grader next year at Loma Linda Academy. But for now, we're enjoying summer festivities, and it's a bit more boisterous around home. So, <laughs> Well, we're delighted to have each of you here with us. We're also so pleased that Christiana is going to be worship, uh, working with us in the area of worship ministry. So tell us a little bit about what excites you, Christiana, about coming to Loma Linda University Church. Worship is something that has always thrilled my soul, and I've always um, been lucky to be a part of it any time I've had the opportunity. Um, I've enjoyed 14 years of ministry of education, um, teaching young people music, uh, but my favorite part of that job was teaching them to worship mm -hmm. through music. Mm -hmm. And I'm excited to be able to take that to a different side here at the University Church, and I know it's going to be fantastic. I can't wait to see what God has in store for our family here. Amen. Amen. We Amen. also are very eager to see that reality unfold. I want to ask you as a University Church family, when you see Christian and Amy and the girls around our church campus or around Loma Linda, that you reach out to them, draw them in, welcome them, let them know how pleased we are to have them here at Loma Linda University Church. Welcome. Brothers and sisters, God has graciously allowed us to come into his presence today. It is my prayer that today we will find the courage to become vessels of God's grace, his love, and his mercy. Welcome to worship.
pray together. Creator of heaven and earth, we declare by faith that you are a good, good father. Uh, in a world that's filled with turmoil and darkness and evil, you yet remain good. And even as we look inward and see the darkness within us, you are faithful to your promise to work all things together for the good of them that are loved and called according to your purpose. This morning, Lord, we confess that we are prone to wander, to leave the God that we love. And yet, though our sins were great, Jesus is greater. So we thank you for the blood of Christ, for his sacrifice, for his life and ministry, and his intercession on our behalf, even this day, as we travel through this life, this journey, seeking to do good, seeking to enact mercy and grace wherever we go, and to sow seeds of peace, particularly in the communities with which we find ourselves a part of. God, thank you for the gathering of these people today, that we have come together as a family and body of Christ. Might you grant us the courage to actually believe the things that we say we believe. Might you give us the courage to act upon those things which we believe, that with conviction and with passion, we might live the life of faith as light and salt throughout the earth. In the name of Jesus, amen. Whether you came to this church from the east or the west, you probably noticed a giant hill on the north. This is, uh, this is the giant earth hill that the uh, latent construction crew has built. And there's been all sorts of comments and jokes that I've heard this morning. We're rebuilding Mount Sinai up there. We just need a burning bush and we can reenact some kind of scene from the Bible. I love that. But that tells you that things are moving. If you look into the, uh, the pit over here on the west side, you'll see that they're down 30-some feet, and they're already bringing back uh, the dirt and spreading it out carefully and compacting it. Friends, they're getting ready for our new basement. It is fantastic. A new basement where we will have for the first time, I believe in the history of this church, an adequate home for our world-class media department. Can I get an amen? amen? They'll have studios there, they'll have office space, and they'll be able to run this first-class media department with a new home. Also, for the first time, we'll have our maintenance department. Their campus is getting so big and they've been working out of tiny closets. It's been that way ever since I've been here, which is quite a while. I look forward to them to have their own home. And friends, 
We have always taken our young adults and had them somewhere else that could accommodate them. For the first time, we're going to bring them back on our campus and have office space, a cafe, and a giant meeting room on the main level. Can I get an amen? Our young adults will be served by this family ministry building. That's only three of nine to ten departments that I know that we transformed. This building will transform the life of this church, and we appreciate you becoming a stakeholder. Friends, if you haven't become a stakeholder and started to give to be a part of this, please we entreat you to give so that you can say, I helped build that. Thank you, Pastor Doug. Happy Sabbath and good morning. So while we enjoy uh, coming up here and sharing information and progress with you, and it is a necessity, we understand that there just simply isn't enough time for us to truly convey everything that is happening. This also leaves questions. A lot of people have questions, and we want those questions to be answered. So Greater Wisdom has determined that what we're going to do a couple times a year is we're going to have a building information session. Our first one is going to be August 1st, that's a Wednesday evening, right here in the sanctuary at 6 o'clock. We desire that everybody would make it a point to be here. This, this is God's house, but it is our church. And we want everybody to feel connected and involved. So whether you're a current stakeholder or you're thinking about becoming a stakeholder, we ask you to please be present, ask questions, seek information, so that you would partner with us as we go down this road and create this ministry building to move God's work forward. Friends, summer is usually a time where our giving dips, but we just had the most wonderful Ju uh, month of July, I mean, month of June. The most wonderful month of June, giving was up, and we look forward to giving steadily increasing over the months. Thank you so much. You're on a winning team. God has ordained what we're doing here, he's opened too many doors, too much support has come in to think otherwise. We are very excited about how this will change our lives. Did you realize they're estimating fall of next year to be complete? Amen. And it's going to change our lives because after all, we, we build, build for his, for his kingdom. kingdom.
one of the important moments in a church's life. In fact, one of the sacred acts of the church's life is the act of baptism. It's wonderful when we baptize people who have come to Jesus from a life that has been very separate from Him. It's also deeply wonderful and meaningful when we have the privilege of baptizing someone who has been born in the cradle of the church and is growing up in its environs. That's my privilege this morning. I am so pleased to introduce you to Ethan Evans No. Ethan is going to be in sixth grade this coming year down at Loma Linda Academy. Ethan comes from a family that is a central and integral part and has been for many, many years of the Loma Linda University Church. Ethan, I've had the privilege of watching you grow from a tiny little one all the way up to where you are today. In fact, a few years ago, we were down a little further on the platform for a child dedication. We've moved up today to this place for a baptism in the continuing journey that Ethan has with Jesus. I want to invite Ethan's family as well as his friends to stand at this time to show your support for and your recognition of his baptism. Yes, please, if you would stand. That's wonderful. You see your family down there, your friends down there. In fact, you see all the church family. These are the ones that will support you in the ongoing journey of your walk with Jesus. Thank you so much. You may be seated. Every once in a while, a young person comes along that you realize and recognize quite quickly has a depth of thought and consideration that is unusually mature for their age. That would be the case with Ethan. I have watched him and listened to him and appreciated talking with him about spiritual things here most recently and about baptism, and have noted that his mind is active and engaged, but also have noted that the Spirit of God is at work in Ethan's life. His dad, Aaron, tells me that one day, kind of out of the blue, Ethan just said, I want to be baptized. So his dad asked him, well, Ethan, tell me, what is it that makes you make that decision? Why would you like to be baptized? And he said, well, I, I chose to be God's child quite a while ago. I have already chosen that in my heart. But I want other people to know it. I want it to be public. Because of that, I would like to be baptized. That's not only good thinking, that's good theology. Because baptism is a public statement that we have accepted what God is doing in our lives and on our behalf. So, Ethan, that's exactly a good reason to be baptized. In fact, Ethan, I want to say to you that I am excited to see what God is going to do in your life in the years to come. I know he has already been at work and he will continue to be at work. He has a special place and a special plan for you. And I think your family and your church family will be eager to see where his footsteps and his spirit will guide you. So we celebrate with you today and we pray for you today. Ethan, God the Father, has loved you with an everlasting love. Jesus, his son, came to draw you to himself, to win you back into a relationship with God. And the Holy Spirit has been active in your life now and will continue to be. And because you have chosen in your young heart to accept God's action on your behalf, it's my privilege as a minister of the gospel and as a friend to baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Buried with him in baptism, raised to walk in newness of life. I have no question but that the Spirit of God is working on hearts here today. The Spirit works in often quiet and imperceptible ways, ways that people around may not recognize or understand. But nevertheless, the Spirit works. If you feel the gentle nudgings of the Spirit, the call of God on your heart, and you would like to do as Ethan did, say, God, I chose you. Maybe I chose you a long time ago, but I've never made it public, and I would like to do so. Those of us on the pastoral team would love to help walk you through that journey to this place in baptism. 
So you can either reach for the card in the pew and fill it out and drop it off at the Welcome Center or contact us or on the website, reach out to us. We would love to respond and guide you in this journey. May God bless you in rich ways. warm your heart. Oh, how special is that? Well, it is time for our children's feature, and I'm looking out there. Are there any kids in the house today? Will you come on down, kiddos, for our children? Oh, yes. We have one. Any more? Oh, here they come. Here they come. I wasn't sure. I thought I was going to have to invite all the adults up. Melinda? Miranda? Matthew? No? All right. All right. Come on down. I'm going to have all of you sit. We're going to leave this space free, so sit right on the steps. Come right over here. We're going to leave this, this space open right on the steps. Awesome. Thank you for coming down. Love having you here. Raise your hand if you're having a good Sabbath so far. All right. Some of you, this side's not, not quite having a good Sabbath. Are you guys, raise your hand if you're having a good Sabbath. Yeah, did you see yourself in the monitor? That's pretty cool, huh? All right, I need some help. First, let me introduce you to Miss Madeline Mace. This is Pastor Doug's daughter. She is here to help today. Thank you, Miss Madeline, for being here. I need some help. Before you raise your hand, let me tell you that I need help from a very brave person who does not get scared. So if you get scared and frightened, oh, look at all these hands. Man, okay, let's see. Hmm. I, I'll pick you. Come on up. I'm going to have you come and stand right here in the center. Are, are you sure about this? You have a chance to back out. You're good? All right, Ethan. Okay, now, I'm going to give you guys some instructions. So I need all eyes over here so you can be sure to hear what's going on and to see. I need the rest of you to follow what Miss Madeline is going to be doing, okay? Ethan, you are only going to do what I tell you to do, okay? So everyone else from this side all the way over, you are going to follow what... Miss Madeline is going to do. Got that? Tap your head if you understand. All right, you got that down. We're going to try it. We're going to try it first. So I want everyone to stand up right where you are. Stand up right where you are. Okay, we're going to try this. Now remember, are you watching and doing what I say? No, no everyone is watching who? Miss Madeline. Madeline. Okay. Here we go. Let's see if you guys can do this. Go ahead. All right. I want everyone to turn to their right. All right. Ethan, I want you to turn that way. I want everyone to turn to their left. All right. Ethan, I want you to turn right. I want everyone to face the choir. All right, Ethan, I want you, oh, you're pretty much, I want you to face everyone and wave. <laughs> or, or don't wave. <laughs> I want everyone to turn and face your parents. All right, Ethan, I want you to turn and face the choir. <laughs> All right, I want everyone to sit down. Okay, Ethan, I want you to turn around and face me, and I want you to take this. Can you start singing Jesus Loves Me into the mic? Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Little ones to him below, they are weak, but he is strong. That's good. Yes. Nice. All right, thank you. You can go ahead. And you know what, boys and girls, that may have seemed like kind of a silly thing for all of us to do, but I want to tell you something. 
It is an illustration that sometimes, guess what? God asks you and he asks me to do things that are different than everyone else around you is doing. And you kind of stand out. And guess what? That takes a lot of courage to be able to do something that is different than everyone else around you is doing. Having courage means standing up and doing the right thing, even though it may be difficult. And when you do that, guess what? You stand up for Jesus. You stand up for Jesus. Now, sometimes we think of courage, we think of big, huge acts. We think of people that get awards and and are on television because they saved a life and they were just courageous. But sometimes having courage and being courageous is everyday life. Sometimes being courageous can be walking away from a fight or an argument with siblings or at school. Sometimes having courage and being courageous means telling the truth no matter what the consequence may be. Sometimes being courageous might look like hmm, maybe standing up for a friend that's being bullied at school because in doing that and doing what is right, you are standing up for Jesus. Now, do any of you have an idea of what it would look like for you to be courageous? Anyone want to share? Raise your hand. What would it look like for you to be courageous? If someone is being mean to your friend, you can stand up and say, hey, stop being mean to my friend. They're a good person. Just stop. Very good. That takes courage to be able to do that. Anyone else want to share? What does it mean to have courage? Up. No courage right there, huh? I say and I say. <laughs> he, doesn't, he doesn't know how to talk. Okay, that's all right. That's all right. I know that mic, once it comes, it's scary. Do you have something? Okay, you can speak right into the mic. Me and my, me and my friend Abby is going to be nice. So we, I'm going to come to her house today. You're going to go to her house today? That's courageous. I know. <laughs> I know, that is very courageous, going to your friend's house. (laughs) Oh, I love it. Well, boys and girls, being courageous and standing for what is right and standing up for Jesus is not always the easiest thing to do. But if you want to be courageous and you want to stand for Jesus, I want all of you to stand right now. Stand right where you are. And I want you to repeat after me. Are you ready? And I want to hear you nice and loud. I want the people all the way up in the balcony in the back to hear you. Are you ready? I choose choose to be courageous to to stand for what is right and to stand for Jesus. Thank you, boys and girls. You may quietly walk back to your seats. Mm
Courage of the Called is the message we will hear from Pastor Randy today. This message is part three of seven in our summer series entitled Ecclesia, the Called Community. Please remember that you can always go to our website at lluc.org to hear any messages that you may have missed. Please join me and together let's read our quotes for today. We must constantly build dikes of courage to hold back the flood of fear. Courage is not simply one of the virtues, but the form of every virtue at the testing point. The paradox of courage is that a man must be a little careless of his life even in order to keep it. In order to fight successfully, a soldier must have both strength and courage. And in God, there is strength and courage sufficient for every worker. Be determined that you will be an overcomer. Constantly behold Jesus. Meditate on his character that, by beholding, you may become changed into his image. Something to think about. Our prayer for each one of you is that God gives you the strength to be courageous. The scripture reading today is from Acts 4, 5 through 13, and I am reading from today's New International Version. If you want to follow in your pew Bibles, it is on page 1,624. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, if we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom You crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has come the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. Courage. Someone said that courage is when you're the only one who knows that you're afraid. Courage is the attribute, I think, of the word I think of when I see three pictures. I want to show them to you one at a time and see if you don't agree with me that maybe the best word to capture what happened in the story behind the picture is the word courage. The first picture. The first picture is from Tiananmen Square back in 1989 when there were events happening in the country of China where people were protesting, pro-democracy protests. The government was striking down in rather strong fashion until it came to this moment in Tiananmen Square when a phalanx of tanks rolled into the square intent on putting a stop to this once and for all. It was then that a man, one man, one lone man, we don't even know his name, he's often been referred to as Tank Man, strode to the front of the phalanx of tanks and stood there as though challenging that power and the tanks ground to a stop. I don't know what you call that. I call that courage. Someone said that courage is when you're the only one who knows you're afraid. Picture number two. January 1982, Air Florida Flight 90 taking off 
in Washington, D.C., ice on the wings. Because of the ice on the wings, the plane could not get lift, and down it went, smashing into the 14th Street Bridge and slicing into the frigid waters of the Potomac River. Seventy of the 74 passengers on board died. Four of the crew perished. Four people on the bridge died. But there were a few survivors, just a few, clinging to pieces of the aircraft in the freezing river on a time clock because of hypothermia. Helicopter came in, dropped a lifeline. A man grabbed it, handed it to someone else. Came back a lifeline, handed it to someone else. When they finally returned to take him, he had slipped into the waters of the river and succumbed to death by drowning. It wasn't until later that they determined that his name was Arlen D. Williams, for which the bridge is now named. I don't know. I don't know what word you would assign to that. But the word I would use for that is courage. Someone said that courage is when you're the only one who knows you're afraid. Picture number three. Three friends, three young friends, American friends in Europe on vacation enjoying a high-speed train ride from Paris to Amsterdam. It is then that a terrorist, gun in hand, begins to shoot, intent on leaving as many people dead as possible. And these three friends, they did have some accomplices as well, but principally these three friends, at great risk to themselves, intervened, preventing further bloodshed. I don't know what you would call that if you didn't call it courage. Someone said, courage is when you're the only one who knows you're afraid. Now, honestly, those stories touch me, inspire me. But the truth is, they're a long ways from my life, and no doubt a long ways from yours as well. When we think about such moments and such incidents and the requirement for courage, we're thankful that there are people who have that kind of courage. But when we think of ourselves in those roles, we think either, I never faced that, or if I did, I'd probably freeze up. In fact, we're probably more like the 70-year-old man on a cruise ship, no less. He was being celebrated that evening at dinner, and he was most uncomfortable with the entire event. It came because of what had happened that morning. A young woman had gone overboard. There were people standing there. She had gone overboard. He was in the water within two or three seconds right after her. She was rescued and saved. And that night, they were honoring him. And he was uncomfortable with everything. But the people wanted to, and so they handed him a mic, shoved it into his hands. Speech, speech, they began to chant. Very reluctantly, he stood up and said, I don't know what to say other than, who pushed me? (laughs) Maybe we feel more like him than them. That matches more who we are, we say. We're just common, ordinary folk. What need do we have for courage? Even in our spiritual lives. We can read this book, especially the New Testament. We can read the history of the Christian church and find that the Christ followers over the centuries and millennia have been people of courage. In fact, if you ever doubt that, just take a book down off the shelf called Fox's Book of Martyrs and peruse the pages, consider the stories, and you will realize that that great cloud of witnesses spoken of in Hebrews has gotten even more crowded because of those who have stood with courage after the closing of the canon. But again, the question is, what does that have to do with me, with you? I'd like to turn this morning to the book of Acts, Acts, the fourth chapter. We are still in our series, Ecclesia, the called community, focusing on the church in the book of Acts. When we were together the last time, we were in Acts 2. We were there when the church was born, the day of Pentecost. Now we're just a bit of time after that in Acts 4. 
But here in Acts 4, we come face to face with a moment, with an instance where courage is required. I remember someone saying, I think it was Morris Vinden, someone saying that those moments of crisis don't change us, they just reveal us. When we face a moment of threat, a moment of danger, we are not changed by that moment unless there's time after the moment to, in consideration, make changes in our lives. But that we are not changed in that moment. We are simply revealed. What's inside comes out. When you think about that, think of the three stories, the three pictures. That means the people involved in those got up that morning to go about life as usual with something already inside them that would cause them to stand out before the day ended. Crisis doesn't change us. It just reveals us. Well, that's what happens here in Acts, the fourth chapter. There is one of those moments like that for the early apostles. The question is, what did it reveal? The setting for the story is this. Sometime after the day of Pentecost, Peter and John are going up to the temple. They're going up to worship, and on their way, they walk through the gate called Beautiful. On their way through that gate, they encounter a man, a paralyzed gentleman, who is begging for alms, asking for mercy from the worshipers as they go in and out from the worship of God. Peter and John stop. They look at him, and they say to him, look at us. Now, no doubt, he then looked up. He had apparently just been seated, just asking, not paying much attention. But when somebody says, look at us, you can expect there's going to be something good. And so he looked up, maybe expecting a rich monetary gift, when Peter looks down and says, silver and gold we don't have. Ah, We don't have anything to give you. Well, accept this. In the name of Jesus of Nazareth, stand up. And the man did. That'll bring a crowd. And so the people crowd together, congregate together, shouting, pointing, gesticulating, asking questions, trying to touch the man. Where did Peter and John go? There is great excitement, which meant great trouble for the religious leaders. The Roman Empire did not appreciate crowds. Crowds could become uncontrollable. They could provide a threat to the kingdom. The Sadducees, part of the Jewish ruling elite, they were in a sense in league with Rome in the sense that they wanted to keep the peace as well. They wanted no problems with Rome. And so while the crowd is gathering, while the man is jumping and dancing, the authorities show up. And it's right there that we join the story in Acts 4. So Acts 4, we're going to begin reading, but we're going to do something different this morning. I'm going to ask if you would join me in reading. You can do it from your today's New International Version Pew Bible, or you can do it from the text as it appears on the screen. I will read every odd numbered verse. Seems fitting. And I'll ask you to read with me every even numbered verse. We'll read it together. Fair enough? So Acts chapter 4, begin reading in verse 1. The priests and the captain of the temple guard and the Sadducees came up to Peter and John while they were speaking to the people. They were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus the resurrection of the dead. They seized Peter and John, and because it was evening, they put them in jail until the next day. But many who heard the message believed. So the number of men who believed grew to about 5,000. The next day, the rulers, the elders, and the teachers of the law met in Jerusalem. Annas, the high priest, was there, and so were Caiaphas, John, Alexander, and others of the high priest's family. They had Peter and John brought before them and began to question them. By what power Or what name did you do this? Then Peter, filled with the Holy Spirit, said to them, Rulers and elders of the people, 
If we are being called to account today for an act of kindness shown to a man who was lame and are being asked how he was healed, then know this, you and all the people of Israel. It is by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom you crucified, but whom God raised from the dead, that this man stands before you healed. Jesus is the stone you builders rejected, which has become the cornerstone. Salvation is found in no one else, for there is no other name given under heaven by which we must be saved. When they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men, they were astonished, and they took note that these men had been with Jesus. But since they could see the man who had been healed standing there with them, there was nothing they could say. So they ordered them to withdraw from the Sanhedrin and then conferred together. What are we going to do with these men, they asked. Everyone living in Jerusalem knows they have performed a notable sign, and we cannot deny it. But to stop this thing from spreading any further among the people, we must warn them to speak no longer to anyone in this name. Then they called them in again and commanded them not to speak or teach at all in the name of Jesus. But Peter and John replied, which is right in God's eyes, to listen to you or to him? You be the judges. As for us, we cannot help speaking about what we have seen and heard. After further threats, they let them go. They could not decide how to punish them because all the people were praising God for what had happened. For the man who was miraculously healed was over 40 years old. So they spend the night in jail. They're arrested, spend the night in jail, and the next morning they're brought out of jail and brought before the high court of the land to answer for what they have done. What is this that you have done? In whose name, by whose authority, whose power? What do you think you're doing? Who do you think you are? And Peter responds. Now, we have to ask the same question we asked last week. We have to ask it this week about Peter. And that is simply, what happened to Peter? It's been just a few weeks ago. He denied and ran frightened into the night. Now he stands up tall, courageous, and speaks clarity in his answer. What happened to him? Well, verse 8 tells us he was filled with the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit happened to him. That's what happened. There was something new and different in Peter now that at the moment of threat, at the moment of danger, at the moment of opportunity, now comes out of him in an entirely different way that, have, that it would have even a few weeks ago. What happened to you, Peter? But the Holy Spirit has an even more specific task in this story. Because it says something about Peter and the apostles in verse 13 that clues us in to what the Holy Spirit is doing in their lives. So I want to reread that one verse, Acts chapter 4, this time verse 13. It says this. This is describing the response of the leaders who are watching Peter and John. When they saw the courage of Peter and John, and realized that they were unschooled, ordinary men. By the way, that word ordinary there in the Greek is pronounced this way, idiotes. <laughs> they were unschooled idiots. Now, it's true the word picked up further negative meaning on the way since that point in time, but the bottom line, they weren't good things that these leaders were thinking. They were unschooled, ordinary men. They were astonished. And they took note that these men had been 
with Jesus. Something has happened to these men. Something has changed them. In fact, they remind me of Jesus. I want to read to you the words of the New Testament scholar John Polhill as he describes this part of the scene. Polhill writes, Peter had borne his testimony. It was now time for the council to deliberate. They assessed the evidence. First, there was the courage, the sheer freedom with which Peter spoke. They hardly expected this from men who had no formal education in matters of the law, who were ordinary laymen. Then there was the fact that they had been with Jesus. He too had been just a commoner, but also with an amazing boldness and knowledge beyond his training. But he too had been a dangerous person, a threat to their peace, and they consequently had condemned him to death. Finally, there was the healed man standing with them before the tribunal. Whether he was there voluntarily in support of Peter and John or whether he had been summoned as a witness, we are not told. In any event, there he was, standing there, exhibit A, a known sign. He was hard to overlook. It was hardly a clear-cut case. The council sat in silence. At this point, there was nothing they could say. The irony can scarcely be missed. The accused spoke with utter boldness and freedom. Their accusers set in stony silence. What are you going to say? There's the man. Well, I'll tell you what they said. They said it's evident that these two have been with Jesus. They've been with him. Well, of course they've been with him. They've been with him throughout his ministry. They've watched him. They've listened to him. They've followed in his footsteps. They have learned his lessons. They have been transformed by his teachings. They have become increasingly like him. But then he had left them, but not without leaving the promise, I will send the Spirit, the Comforter. He will magnify me in your lives and will guide you. And so now, though Jesus physically was not present, the Holy Spirit's presence in their lives was guiding them in their journey with Jesus, slowly but certainly transforming them into His image. They're conferring together and saying, these people have been with Jesus. New Testament scholar David Williams says this, Indeed, it may have been the council's recollection of Jesus that lay behind the comment, they took note that these men had been with Jesus. We cannot think that they only now discovered that Peter and John were Jesus' disciples. They must have known this much, at least about them. But now it was borne in upon them how like Jesus they were. When Pilate had condemned Jesus, they had thought that they had heard the last of him. Why else put him to death? But they had reckoned without the power of the Spirit, and in these Spirit-filled men, Jesus, in a sense, stood before them again. Would they never be rid of him? He's back, and he's back in the presence of these followers because the Holy Spirit has been at work. They've been with Jesus. So when the moment of crisis comes, what is now within them emerges. And what emerges is courage. No longer frightened rabbits fleeing into the night. Now men of courage standing tall. Because crisis doesn't change you, it reveals you. Thinking about that, some have underlined the great difference between the church of that day and the church of our day. In fact, N.T. Wright, the great British scholar and theologian, says, I've taken note of the bishop here in our land in the U.K. who said this of the difference between the church then and the church now. He said, this bishop says, when Paul showed up, there were riots. 
When I show up, they serve tea. <laughs> Quite a difference. So where does that leave us? After all, the pictures we show, you say, that's not my life. Even this through which the apostles pass, that's not my life. So what should I do in response to this? I want to make two suggestions, very simple. Two suggestions. First one, pray for the Holy Spirit. Pray for the Holy Spirit to enter your heart and life in a way the Spirit has not been given permission before. Pray that the Spirit will baptize your heart and your soul and your mind, will saturate your person, your experience, your life. Pray that what is within you that will come out in a moment of crisis is the Holy Spirit. Pray for the Spirit. And secondly, pray for courage. Pray for courage. Pray, God, so work into me in my own life and experience the reality of your Holy Spirit that when a moment comes where courage is required, that your Holy Spirit will have needed enough of that into the dough of my life that courage is what will emerge. Pray for the Spirit. Pray for courage. But still you may say, but I don't know. In my life, I'm so ordinary, so mundane. There's nothing big, nothing grand. I'll never face those kinds of moments. Then start small. I want to read to you two pieces, short ones, but pieces. One from a woman, one from a man. One through a woman's eyes, one through a man's eyes about whether or not you need courage only in the great or also in the small. The first are the words of the poet Maya Angelou, who said this. She had been asked what were the important lessons she had learned from her mother, and she responded, I would say she encouraged me to develop courage, and she taught me by being courageous herself. And years later, I realized that one isn't born with courage. One develops it. And you develop it by doing small, courageous things in the same way that one wouldn't set out to pick up a 100-pound bag of rice. If that was one's aim, the person would be advised to pick up a 5-pound bag and then a 10-pound and then a 20-pound and so forth until one builds up enough muscle to actually pick up 100 pounds. And that's the same way with courage. You develop courage by doing courageous things, small things, but things that cost you some exertion, mental and, I suppose, spiritual exertion. Pray for the Spirit. Pray for courage. God of grace, don't let me just wait for the great event that may never come. Let me begin with what's right in front of me the courageous choice that needs to be made now in the small thing. Somebody stopped me after first service and said, in today's climate, we actually might need the opposite of what the bishop in England said. Maybe what we need to say is when a riot breaks out, we serve tea <laughs> to bring people together. An act of reconciliation, an act of courage. That's the woman's voice. Now the man's voice, author Mike Airy, who said this, writing to men, speaking to men, and speaking about Hollywood. He says, The problem with looking to Hollywood for the image of masculinity, even those true-to-life stories of courage, is that it feeds my desire for glory. Courage isn't only in the big accomplishments, it's in the small acts, too. When I leave the theater and scratch the car door next to me getting into my car, my decisions about whether or not to leave a note admitting my mistake isn't glorious. Nobody will make a movie about my choice. I can hide if I choose to. But situations like this shape our courage and virtue. Or imagine leaving the theater and returning home to a wife who is sexually unresponsive or perpetually angry or domineering or unkempt. The temptation to find release and fulfillment elsewhere can be overwhelming. Escape promises what reality can't provide. Our response in that moment can be just as courageous as what we do when we decide to protect a fallen pilot or storm a cockpit. Courage is visiting our moms and dads and caring for them as they grow older instead of abandoning them to others' care. 
Courage is integrity in business when no one else sees it or keeping my promise when I'd rather do anything else. Hollywood doesn't make movies about this true masculine courage. It's not just in the big moments, as valid as those may be. It's in those simple acts of everyday life, those decision moments that confront each of us every single day. Will I have the courage to reach across the aisle to somebody who sees the political world very differently than I do and extend a hand of reconciliation and peace? Courage. If you're a child here, will you have the courage to come to the aid of the child being bullied on the playground? If you're an adult, when you sit down in a busy restaurant, crowded eatery, Will you have the courage to bow your head in prayer? It depends on what's going on inside of you. Because those moments of decision, those moments of potential threat of some kind, don't change you. They just reveal you. For the disciples, it was revealed that they had been with Jesus. Philip Halley was an articulate man, bright man, Studied scholar, keen intellect, trained at Oxford and Harvard, Rhodes Scholar. He had also served in World War II in the U.S. Armed Forces. And it was probably the bringing together of those two realities that left him with questions about a tiny hamlet in the country of France in World War II. Les Champons. There in Les Champons, he realized, understood, I don't know how, from reading, research, or study, he understood that the citizens of that little village had done something dramatically differently than the ones all around them in countless other places in France and Europe at the time. They had come to the aid, to the rescue of the Jewish people around and among them at great threat and danger to themselves. And so Halley wanted to understand why, wanted to know why. The researcher's mind and intellect, he traveled to France, traveled to that little hamlet, and expected to find, well, heroes, larger than life, courageous, firm and strong, backbones of steel, set apart from their neighbors. He found quite the opposite. What he discovered when he got there was ordinary people people that looked like everyone else, people that lived like everyone else, just ordinary people. And so he began to ask questions, question after question, person after person about what their lives were like, what they did, what formed their thinking, why they had done what they had done in World War II. After all of his questions, this is the conclusion he reached. The people of Les Champons, of that little town, he decided, acted differently because week in and week out, consistently, they gathered for worship. And their pastor, in worship, talked to them about the life of Jesus, told them what Jesus was like, told them what Jesus did, spoke to them about the ethic of Jesus, told them that when Jesus said, love your neighbor, that included the Jewish people. Told them, we don't get to choose our neighbor. And if we belong to Jesus, this is what he said to do. He was talking to one elderly woman who said, when the Nazi guards show up, I faked a heart attack. <laughs> She was afraid. But then she said, however, when it came to the Jewish people, we knew what to do. Because pastor had told us, week in and week out, for a long time, what Jesus thought, how Jesus felt, and he had said, one day Jesus will ask something of you, and then you will have to act. So she said, we knew exactly what we had to do. I can't tell you for sure, but I think, I think that Dr. Luke, who penned this book called Acts, I think if he were to be describing those people, he would say this. 
The Holy Spirit was in them. And because of that, one could know that they had been with Jesus. I don't know what you will face this week. Some small opportunity, some potential threat, or some serious danger. I don't know. But I do know this. When that moment comes for any of us, it's not going to change us. It's just going to reveal us. And so my question is this. When it's said and done, Will people say of you and of me, they were with Jesus? I pray, I pray that that will be true. And now may the love of God the Father, the presence of Jesus Christ His Son, and the power of the Holy Spirit go with you from this place and be with you today and evermore. Amen.
Hello, good friends. Glad to be with you again. And I am going to admit we do a little catching up. Hence, you're going to say, they have a birthday now? Well, they did very recently. And right at the top is Martha Messinger. I am so honored to be able to greet you, lady. And I got to see you last Sabbath. And now to wish you a very, very happy 91st birthday and to see you there with members of your family. Hello, Marvin and Beverly Peters. So glad to know it's your 85th birthday, Marvin, but your 61st wedding anniversary. And I'm here to extend warmest congratulations to you too. Leela Reiki up at Oakhurst, California. So glad to be reminded of your birthday and wonderful things that happen in your life. There you are with your family. All the best, Leela Reiki. Jeanette and Glenn Edgerton up in Fairview, Oregon. Yes, we're looking at these wonderful pictures of Jeanette, and for all we could do, we couldn't find a picture of you, Glenn, but I wish you a very happy 91st birthday while you too are marking your 71st wedding anniversary. Warmest congratulations to Jeanette and Glenn Edgerton, Richard and Patricia Morda, right here in Loma Linda. Hello, you two, and I'm glad to be reminded of your anniversary, and I'm here to wish you the very very best. And now, folks, you listen up because we've got a very special friend we're about to introduce to you. She is Salma Moore, and this is her 100th birthday. And she's meeting there with children, grandchildren, great-grandchildren. We are so proud of you, even as you're a Laker fan. No, it's a Dodger fan. God bless you. Hello, Caroline Retzer. Always glad to be where you are, and I'm glad that's pretty often. And now to get to say happy birthday, Caroline. Hello, Alice Cayley, over there in Centralia, Illinois. I wish we had a picture of you? We don't, but we're here to greet you. Happy birthday, Barbara and Les Stannard, right here in Loma Linda. And I'm so glad to get to see you two once in a while. And now to let everybody know you are marking your 74th wedding anniversary. Rosalind Ludwig Miller over there in Miamisburg, Ohio. So glad to wish you a happy birthday, lady. Bill Stone over there in Somerset, Kentucky. You and Vienna, we're always glad to be reminded. And now, Bill, it's your 81st birthday. Congratulations. Rafaela Walker, Brooklyn, New York, is marking her 103rd birthday. I think it is. Friends, tell me we get to say happy birthday, Rafaela. Brian Hartnell, you are wonderful as a part of our media team and University Church and your friendship all around. So glad to say happy birthday, Brian Hartnell. Peggy Best, Atlanta, Georgia. So glad to be in touch with you, Peggy, and to know it's your birthday and to say happy, happy greetings to you and to learn that your great-granddaughter, Alana Johnson-Jones, is three years old. Isn't she a doll? So glad to be in touch with you folks and to say happy birthday, Peggy and Alana. Hello, Trace and Julia. Yes, I remember when I got to stand up with you at your wedding and now your 13th anniversary. You two are darling, a blessing in my life. And those children of yours, they are absolutely the best. Happy anniversary, Trace and Julia. Robert and Cheryl Smith, marking your anniversary over there in Wenatchee. And I'm so glad to be reminded of your birthdays and now your anniversary. Happy greetings to you too. Max Wood, do we go back a ways, clear back to Laurelwood Academy, and now continue to have birthdays. Isn't it wonderful? Happy birthday, Max Wood. David McDonald, bless your heart. I'm glad to be reminded of your birthday, to see you there with your Sheila. And there you are, a wonderful presentation of some kind. I wish I could have been there to hear it. Happy, happy birthday, David McDonald. And a happy birthday to Molly Weaver. Hi, Molly. Always glad we can see you. And there you are with your daughters, your granddaughters. And I say happy birthday, friend Molly. Hi, Maurice Brooks. It's so good to see you from time to time. And now to get to say happy birthday, Maurice. And glad to know about your work with the media and warm greetings 
to carol as a part of the orchestra as well. Janine Fuller over there in Orange Beach, Alabama. Always glad to be in touch with you folks, and I wish you a very happy birthday, Janine. Hello, Margaret Luttrell. So glad to be reminded that it's your birthday, and I'm here to wish you a very happy 93rd birthday. Priscilla Obst right here in Loma Linda, a part of the Loma Linda Church. And I wish you a very happy birthday, Priscilla, as well. Janet Frank Armstrong, thank you for being a part of my life for many, many years. And now to get to say happy birthday, Janet, over in Paris, France, Geneva du Bois Fountain. Happy birthday, lady and many, many more. Ann Maxwell, so good to be reminded of your birthday too. And I just had to let the folks see the kind of climate you live in, in that beautiful snowy environment. Happy birthday, Ann. And Verna Murphy over in Warren, Massachusetts, happy birthday to you too, lady, and many more. And finally, David Husso, down Temecula Way. Happy birthday, David, and to get to see you there with your very special friends. Until next time, I'm Dan Matthews, and I'll be back.